Thank you very much, Nicola, and thank you to Leslie and the organisers for inviting me to speak at this prestigious conference. Just like in the way that in the novel Name of the Rose, an existing book can sometimes tell us about the existence of a lost one, sometimes the sources that we are consulting to find out about a standing building can tell us, alert us to the presence of a hidden one. And one of the most intriguing instances I've ever encountered started with an indenture of the transfer of jewels from one royal official to another, officials of the King of England. And it was enrolled in 1327, the very end of the reign of King Edward II. It's talking about the contents of a room inside one of the turrets along the inner curtain wall of the Tower of London, listing the items locked in different wooden chests. And then suddenly it mentions something that really got my attention, something of very high sensitivity indeed. A pouch bearing the title, The Keys of the Inner Chamber Next to the Black Hall in Which the King's Private Jewels Are Placed. Good stuff, eh? Now, the name Black Hall gets mentioned often enough in my medieval accounts for us to be able to locate the room with some confidence. It clearly lay inside the White Tower, the Norman Keep in the centre of the fortress. And helpfully, one account mentions repairs to a well inside the Black Hall, which ties it down to one room, the big western room of the White Tower basement. So when my indenture speaks of the inner chamber beside it, we can be pretty sure what we're talking about the outsidal vaulted room in the southeast corner of the building, out there, two storeys below St John's Chapel. Originally, with only one door and one tiny window, it was in this dark and remote room that the king's private jewels were kept, so one of the most sensitive and inaccessible places in the whole kingdom. It's one of the many historical ironies that the room in question is now a public museum space and the entrance to the White Tower gift shop. <laughs> and millions of tourists every year. Now, I must make an apology at this moment that my paper is a bit short on architecture. Um, I will be showing you rooms where the, 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 the name plain is about as kind as you could possibly have, but the actual room of this room was so boring that I really couldn't bear to put anything up from the evocative 14th century uh, uh, oak door at its entrance. In this paper, I'm going to be looking at research to identify royal treasuries, particularly in London, including a number of spaces that still survive. And I'm going to try to discuss why those rooms were chosen, and particularly how they worked. As we'll see, most or possibly all of them were actually initially built for other purposes, were pressed into service as treasuries with fairly little adaptation. Some are within the Tower of London, but I'm particularly interested, and there's been reference to this already, in the east range of the cloister of Westminster Abbey. And finally, I'm going to say a little bit about the building known from the 20th century as the Jewel Tower, which was formerly part of the Palace of Westminster. Much of my evidence is documentary, and it's a pity that while the documents generally have more to say about the objects themselves than the places in which they were kept, the treasure itself, for obvious reasons, has generally not survived. As with some of the other speakers today, the lost items can really only be evoked through comparison with survivals in other collections. So I'll start briefly with the Tower of London, which, like other royal, important royal castles, almost certainly contained a treasury and was used for that function from very early in its history, if not from the very beginning. For example, as early as 1100, early chronicle sources speak of another royal castle, Winchester Castle, as, in a quote, a place where the royal Tisaurus is kept. Order at the Tunis, writing also of Winchester, says there was a huge airery crammed with hordes of coins, and sadly, at the Tower of London, this sort of early documentary confirmation sadly doesn't exist, but it's certainly plausible that treasure, and here, to answer Tom's question, I do mean both cash and precious goods, were kept in security. It's even possible to speculate, and it has to be speculation, that certain rooms inside the White Tower may have been originally intended for this purpose. At the beginning, I introduced us to the inner basement room as a treasury in the 14th century. More recently, architectural historians have wondered whether the room that lies directly above it might not have worked in the same way, even under the Normans. It lies immediately behind a huge niche at one end of the big room, which I've argued elsewhere and may have been designed as an architectural setting for the royal throne. An old room contains a small square windowless space in the thickness of its north wall, no larger than a cupboard, and certainly too small for a bed. 
So it would arguably make a perfect strong room, and indeed a prop cupboard for royal display in the main room. But what we'll be seeing through later periods is that there is a pendulum swing in royal usage between storing treasure in the Tower of London and moving it elsewhere. And during the 13th century, there was a centrifugal movement away from the Tower towards a new location, Westminster Abbey. The reasons why Henry III and Edward the I were happy to outsource the security of their treasure are still a little unclear. During their reigns, it's true that the tower was becoming increasingly specialised as a place for manufacturing and stockpiling arms and armour, as well as a prison for political prisoners. Though I think it's difficult to imagine the pressures of space were so acute that they couldn't keep single small rooms as treasuries. More probable, I think, is that it was simply inconvenient for those charged with the treasure to have to rub shoulders on a daily basis with the armourers and the jailers. Although well, this in itself doesn't explain why the treasure couldn't simply be moved into the palace of Westminster, that for me remains a mystery. But on the other hand, as we've already heard this morning, using monasteries as treasuries is part of a wider phenomenon. Leslie talks about uh, John um, lodging his treasure with the Cistercians of Fountains. And as some of you else will know, since the late 12th century, the Knights Templar of London that provided kings and barons with a remarkably varied range of banking services, which included the storage of valuables. But possibly from the 1250s, almost certainly from the late 1260s, and very certainly before the 1290s, a royal treasury was established within the claustral buildings of the Benedictine Abbey of Westminster. Documentary evidence from the end of the 13th and early 14th century suggests two possible spaces where this might have been. The undercroft of Henry III's new chapter house, and the pit's chamber, which lies immediately to the south of it, at the north end of the dormitory undercroft, which is a beautiful Romanesque space, if anyone doesn't know it. Documentary references are admittedly incomplete, and they contradict one another in some important ways. In fact, there isn't any good reason why both rooms might not have been used, but the evidence for the pig's chamber, as we assess it now, seems by far the stronger of the two. But wherever it was, I'd just like to spend a moment with an inventory of this treasury in 1299, because it gives a very evocative picture of what the royal treasury in the Abbey was like at the turn of the 14th century. Underneath the preamble, at the top, almost illegible, is the first heading in Magna Cista de F, in the large chest labelled F, and we start item, a gold coronet from which two stones are missing, priced £125, where a note on the right-hand side, obviously scribbled in later, notes that the Lord Otto de Grandson removed this from the Westminster wardrobe. The next two items in chest F are also coronets, and the fourth is a column of pearls, all fairly consistent as items of precious personal ornament. But then, the contents of chest F start to wander off the point into the world of plate. A crystal pitcher given to the king by the Countess of Cornwall, a silver and gilt flag, and within a few entries it's gone completely crazy. We have uh, an, an ivory chest set for horn which was once belonging to St. Thomas Canterbury, and it goes on in the same incoherent way. And in other chests, too, no amount of rationalisation can explain the contents. A cloth, which is called Mathamundi, a book of Orgolan chant beginning in Alleluia, a small gold knife in a cold covered with stones. You get a sense of an extremely precious, but very, very badly ordered junk room. <laughs> but it's important not to lose sight of quite how precious we're talking. There's another indenture listing items brought from the Tower of London into the Abbey a couple of years earlier, in 1297. The first item alone, a gold crown with precious stones costing £4,000. To give some idea of value, £4,000 would build you about a third of the whole of building Beaumaris Castle, a giant building from scratch. So it's a ridiculously um, high amount of money. But, and we've already heard this morning, this royal treasury was a disaster. In the summer of 1993, officials realised that it had been burgled and large parts of the treasure had been taken away. Edward I, then fighting in Scotland, ordered the mayor of London, the constable of the tower, to hold inquests through various wards of the city and in Middlesex to identify the guilty, and at the same time, they had to get any of the treasure left behind into a place of safety. Events later showed that the robbery 
had happened around two months before it was noticed. <laughs> On the 20th of June, the Keeper of the King's Wardrobe, John Drossard, had the very unenviable task of going to the Abbey to make his inspection with an inventory of what was left. And his record of this inspection is important, not just on account of the scale of the losses, which amounted to £100,000, much of it in gold and silver cups and plate, but because it describes the normal procedure of getting into the treasury strongly. And I quote, he was given the keys of the said treasury and canvas pouch with its seal intact and unbroken by the cofferer of the wardrobe who on the king's order carried the said keys with him. And in the presence of several named others, he took the intact seal off the pouch, took out the keys, and opened the doors of the said wardrobe. And then, with these other people, he entered the wardrobe. Once inside, he found the treasury had been broken into, the chests and coffers destroyed, and many of the goods secretly carried off. So the document states that the keys were not kept in the abbey, but by one of the officials of the king's wardrobe. As they, to summarise the wardrobe, it's a very complicated subject. Basically, it's the department of the royal household responsible for stuff, buying stuff, making stuff, repairing stuff, and keeping the stuff safe, or in this instance, not. That person would normally be travelling with the king, or he might be based other times in the palace of Westminster. So unless the monks had a duplicate set of keys, the idea that this was definitely an inside job seems to be a little difficult to uphold. Now, coming to the end of the story, the various inquiries produced many answers, but their reports had several points in common. The robbery had been carried out by a gang led by a certain Richard Puddicott, a discontented gentleman of Oxfordshire, but he had benefited from complicity or indiscretion from several people in high places, including, actually, the keeper of the Palace of Westminster, just across the way, who was allowing some very dubious characters to make use of the palace while Edward I was at his wars. And famously, there's this near-contemporary image of Richard Puddicott producing the treasury. It's a marginal illustration, massively blown up here, in the manuscript of the Rochester Flores Historiarum, now in the British Library. It might be argued that a Benedictine monk of Rochester had particular interest in showing a single thief without a tonsure, and thereby detecting blame away from his brother monks in Westminster. But nevertheless, this drawing has spawned a certain literature about the architectural detail of the treasury, if we can call it. Does it show an octagonal building like the chapter house basement, or a simple rectangular one like Pitt's chamber? Are the pointed arches in the sketch compatible with the Romanesque architecture of the Pitt's chamber? And so on and so stupid. It's worth making the point that the artist of the sketch was interested in showing the events rather than their, their setting, and he had no earthly reason to know what the treasury looked like. The prudent course, I'm sure, is to treat the sketch as a lovely historical curiosity and then to dismiss it entirely as a bit of architectural historical evidence. Though it sounds far-fetched, the inquest determined that the thieves raided the treasury from the monastic cemetery on the eastern side, which they were able to enter repeatedly over several months through a small gate leading out of the royal palace. One entertaining detail common to several versions is that the thieves had sown hemp seed close to the walls of the Abbey buildings, watching it grow in the spring into a thick shrubbery. Under cover of this, they were able to break into the treasury itself from outside the building, almost certainly by widening a ground floor window. And excitingly, during a recent archaeological recording inside the gym of Westminster Abbey School, which actually abuts the eastern range of the medieval cloister, Tim Tatton Brown has identified an area of disturbed masonry in the East Wall. And there it is, where someone has dug into the foundations and someone else has come along and blocked it up afterwards, uh, around the area of the former opening. Could this possibly relate to blocking up the hole made by Richard Puddicott? Yes, I think it could. <laughs> the other slightly comical point which emerges from these inquests is that 1303 wasn't the only time that the Abbey treasury had been burgled. In fact, Richard Puddicott knew about the Royal Treasury only because the previous year he'd broken into the Abbey himself, this time getting in through the upper floor of the chapter house using a ladder that someone had left against the wall. And his confession goes on to describe him stealing valuable items of plate from cupboards behind the refectory door. But the Treasury itself had already been robbed at least twice in its short life. In 1226, a certain John Cook was committed to Newgate Prison for trespasses committed in Westminster Abbey in the King's Treasury there. And during the inquest into the 1303 theft, 
A third robbery in the Westminster Treasury also came to light, this time from 1299, um, and it came out in the testimony of the jurors of Walbrook towards Ludgate. Moreover, they said, the jurors have a great suspicion against the aforesaid monks, because four years ago, this same treasury was broken into from inside their cloister, namely under the door of the said treasury towards the cloister. When this came to light, the abbot paid the king a certain amount of money so that nothing more would be said about it. <laughs> the third military burglary had several consequences for the storage of royal treasury, one of which was to cause the wardrobe administrators to move the treasury back into the Tower of London for safety. The conflict of institutions within the fortress certainly hadn't gone away. In fact, the continuing war in Scotland had certainly made things worse, and it's probable that for that reason the new treasury accommodation was rather improvised in the turret labelled F on this plan. The plans from the 16th century, so it has nothing to do with treasury, so I've just used it for convenience. This is the building that we now call the Flint Tower, and it's described in uh, wardrobe inventory as a turret beside the east gable of the Great Chapel. The treasury stayed in this room for much of the reign of Edward II. It's clear that a system of dual control was instituted in the Tower of London, with some of the most important keys once again being kept off-site. The keys to the turret itself, the main front door, which would be somewhere down there, were held uh, uh, were held by the officials of a completely different institution, the Exchequer, and these people would be based at Westminster and would come to the tower specially. But once they had opened up the tower, only the keeper of the wardrobe had the keys to the chests which contained the objects themselves. And once again, these inventories reveal some wonderfully weird juxtapositions. As a historian, I would love to have a rummage in the ornery labelled C and D, if I could find it, and two titles, containing, among other things, a sapphire from the reliquary of the cross neath, that's a relic of the true cross, a chest set, a mirror, a crown in the old style with twelve fleurons, and a basket containing a charter given to, by the king to Piers, later Earl of Cornwall, that is the late Piers Gaveston, Edward II's supposed lover. Later in the reign, after 1323, when Bishop Stapleton of Exeter undertook many long overdue reforms, some attempt was made to impose order on this. And we read of several flaws in the White Tower, containing other elements of the treasury of the wardrobe, especially in the White Tower basement. And that's when we read about the secret jewel chamber being kept there. But the Abbey obviously had been completely abandoned as a location for the wardrobe, and probably within only a few years of the robbery, Building works were undertaken, this time to create a truly secure treasury in the pig's chamber in the east range of the cloister. Most notable is the walling up of the northern part of the pig's chamber under the day stair up to the dormitory that's there, and the strengthening of the door leading directly out uh, into the east cloister walk. And now it had two doors, one opening inwards, one opening outwards, so that both of them could be locked from the outside. With two doors and eventually six locks, this now became a very, very strong entrance. And surviving accounts of the king's remembrance, particularly from the reign of Edward III, show clearly that the pig's chamber from then on was once again heavily used as a treasury for exactly the same kind of storage that the abbey had known in Edward I's reign. From as early as 1330, an indenture referred to the keys of the treasury of Westminster underneath the dormitory. A few years later, there's a record that the great crown lay in a chest in the king's treasury within the cloister of Westminster next to the chapter house, and so on. Once again, we have evidence in some of the documents that there was a system of external control in operation, and the monks had no access to this treasure chamber. In 1330, it was stated that the key of the treasury is in a small coffer in the room of the chamberlains in the exchequer of receipt within the palace of Westminster over the road. Rather confusingly, the treasure was now split between treasuries in the Abbey and back at the Tower of London, the White Tower. And there doesn't seem to me to be any clear good rationale for which types of objects were kept in which place. Sometimes the crowns were at Westminster, sometimes they were at the Tower. Most of the vestments seem to have stayed at the Tower rather than at Westminster. The documents and the relics, rather bizarrely, were not kept separately and were mixed in with all this other material. So, on this system of situation of chaos, finally, in the 
second half of the 14th century, we have some imposition of order with, at last, what might be the construction of a surviving building intending for treasury, intended for treasury use. The structure, known since the early 15th century, was the Jewel House, and now called the Jewel Tower. This lay at the end of the King's Garden, the Garden of the Privy Palace, which contained the residential buildings of the King and Queen at the south end of Westminster Palace. The tower's construction was documented in 1365 to 66 under the direction of the master mason Henry Heathley, with the contribution of the carpenter Hugh Hurd, both of them early in their careers. The royal clerk who supervised the works and submitted the account was William Sleaford, a clerk and surveyor of works within the Palace of Westminster. But significantly, he was also entitled Keeper of the Jewels of Gold and Silver Vessels within the palace. And if that wasn't enough, he was also Dean of St. Stephen's Chapel. It's a natural thing that scholars should make the connection between William's job as a keeper of treasure and the tower he built that almost certainly came to be used in this way. And it's generally interpreted as having been built specifically to store gold and silver plate. But recently, an objection has been made, and quite a reasonable one, that if we didn't come to this with a preconception that the Jewel Tower was built for treasure, we might well read its architecture differently. Its position at the corner of the King's Garden, the lovely Tiesa and vault on its ground floor, its large windows facing into the garden, and its impressive views from its flat roof over the palace and the river, all seem to fit much more neatly, some say, with thoughts of royal leisure and pleasure. Perhaps the jewel town might have been built as a garden pavilion, perhaps one of several within the garden, and was later co-opted for treasure use. I have to admit, there's nothing in the original documentation that says anything about what the tower was built for. The earliest possible references come from the early 15th century, so 50 years on, in an account speaking of taking jewels in and out of the tower assigned from them within the Palace of Westminster. And only a century after construction do we see references to the present building as the Jewel House. But I do think there are elements of the building's design that favour the interpretation as a Jewel House from the outset. And I'm not going to show the first of these because Leslie has already referred to it, but the Tiersa and Vault, um, with its grotesque central uh, bosses, fits very neatly within an iconographic scheme that Leslie has pointed out of intimidating and grotesque sculpture within other treasure rooms. It's a very important piece of context. When we look elsewhere in the quite plain architecture of the building, there are other elements of its design that favour the interpretation of security. At the entrance to the top floor, for example, the surviving door, made of bolted oak, almost certainly of the 14th century, was the inner of two doors. There was originally a second door opening outwards into the stairwell. This could easily have equated to a system of dual control with keys being held by two different people. And certainly, as, you'll, as you can hopefully see, it's very similar to the double doors of the royal treasury around the corner in the pit's chamber. Perhaps the same concern for security can be seen in the original pattern of fenestration in the tower. The present building contains several windows introduced for the first time in the 18th century when the tower was used as a record store for the House of Lords and natural light was obviously preferable to candles or lamps because of the risk of fire. In the 14th century, the tower contained no ground floor windows at all, apart from one facing into the garden. On the first floor, apart from other inward facing windows, there were only two small windows, one facing south, the window in the middle of the three there, and one around the corner facing east. Only on the second floor was it deemed high enough to risk a few more windows, as well as the two shown here. There were three others around the corner. And the building account helpfully specifies that all of these windows were protected by iron bars. All things considered, the surviving fabric of the building and the building account do allow us to infer some kind of use for the different spaces within the jewel tower. <coughs> all floors were similar in plan, with one large room and a smaller living room within the turret containing a latrine. Once again, I think that, as we've already heard this morning, um, some of the keepers almost certainly lived in with the treasure. The ground floor is the most ornate, with the vault and formerly the very large fireplace and window, and this seems most appropriate as the office of the keeper of the king's treasure, in which he dealt with items coming in and out, negotiated with goldsmiths over manufacture and repair. The architectural character of the rooms becomes simpler as one climbs up the building. The middle floor had some impressive features, including a nice fireplace, 
but it was probably at least in part a storeroom, whereas the second floor was very functional in style, and also with its double doors more secure. It was almost certainly here that some of the items of the highest value were kept. The final element of the security of the jewel tower was the excavation of a moat around the exterior. This was part of the original construction, and the account specifies that 23 ditches worked on it between the 12th of July and 16th of August 1366. The moat seems to have only closed off the area immediately around the tower itself, specifically on the north, west, and south sides. To the east, there was no ditch, as the tower communicated directly with the garden. The account goes on to detail that a certain Thomas Bolton then received 30 shillings for connecting that ditch to an existing ditch that ran into the River Thames, and the account is explicit that the moat system was connected to the river, so that at high tide it was possible for small boats to come up to a small landing stage in the garden wall, which sadly is now covered by the modern road bridge. This feature, I think, may be key to our understanding of how the jewel tower was designed to work. Because looking at Edward III's itinerary, we see that around 1362 or 1363, a few years before the building of the tower, the king's use of Westminster Palace saw a marked decrease, and in general, it stayed low for the rest of his reign. He would rather be a Sheen or a Windsor or at other palaces in the southeast. By the time the jewel tower was built, the king was unlikely to be staying in the Privy Palace for long periods, except on the occasion of parliaments. So the Jewel Tower thus makes a bit more sense, I think, as a distribution centre on the River Thames for sending objects out to other places. It relates to the King's absences more than to his stays in Westminster. So I'm running out of time, so just to draw a few conclusions from this. The survival corpus of structures in London cannot be representative. Even within the Tower of London and the Palace of Westminster, there must have been several secure repositories which we've now lost completely. Those that we still have, some of them originally built for other purposes, rather predictably do share certain architectural attributes. They are located to a more or lesser extent off the beaten track. There's always some concern for control over their entrance and exit. There's a Spartan lack of provision for comfort. But they all show this to different degrees. The Pitt's chamber actually lay in the heart of a monastery. The jewel tower had latrines and fireplaces and could be used residentially. And at other times, the various treasuries in the Tower of London contained records, arms and armour in store, and of course prisoners. The documentary record, limited and contradictory, is key to identifying all of the spaces that I've been discussing today. But it's useful, I think, to hold the treasury function in mind when we're looking for interpretations of other, less well-documented sites. So in the ruined castles of Porchester and Restorm, for example, and I could have chosen many others, close to the main apartments, we find dead-end rooms without outward-facing windows, lacking generally in the comforts that normal royal residents would demand. Treasure houses, I think, could well provide the explanation for the design and configuration of these rooms. When we remember that the whole function of the monarchy and aristocracy depended very much on looking the part at all times, on strengthening social bonds through the giving and receiving of precious goods, there was a clear need, a perpetual need, for spaces such as these. And for that, they deserve to get their due recognition among all the other possible functions of royal sites in the Middle Ages. Thank you very much.